living by faith is somewhat risky because you're never sure you're doing the right thing until you see it happen and have the evidence. Faith is not reasonable. Faith a reason is safe. Faith is not. Slightly butchered that quote, but Greg shared that last week from an acquaintance of his, Ray Brooks. And it's really just been bouncing in my head all week. I've just been chewing on that, and it's been stirring up my heart. In the Bible, we read of these accounts of people who were just like us, yet we see these demonstrations of their faith, and, and we read about it, and it tends to make the demonstrations of our own faith look safe in comparison. We read Hebrews 11, and it's plain to see that the faith of these Christians moved them in such a way that they were not willing to risk much. They were willing to risk it all. Their faith had so gripped them and compelled them to run after the object of their faith that they unhitched and abandoned, forsook the whole world in their pursuit of Yahweh. And we look at that kind of faith, we read that kind of faith in the Scriptures, and we say, wow, I would love to have that kind of faith. Man, that's, 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 that's the faith I want to have. The faith of these spiritual giants that we read about in Hebrews 11. But listen to what Peter says. The Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, Listen, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter, by the Spirit of God, is addressing a specific audience. He's speaking intentionally to a specific people, and we know he's speaking to the people of God, both Jew and Gentile alike. He's speaking to the elect of God. But it's how he addresses them that is the key to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. This means that the faith of Peter and James and John, Paul and the, and the other apostles, you know the ones who laid the foundation of the church? Yeah, those guys? Peter says that our faith and their faith are of equal standing. Please tell me you feel the weight of that this morning. Our faith is of equal standing to the Apostle Paul, to the Apostle Peter. Equal standing. It's the Greek word isatomos. It means equally precious and equally honored. God doesn't look at Paul and say, that's the kind of faith that I like. And then he looks to you and say, well, you know, you, you trusted in Jesus and all, but you really missed the mark otherwise. No. Your faith is of equal standing as Paul's, as Peter's. There's only one faith, Ephesians 4. And it's of equal precious honor among all of God's people. Not just a select few that are spiritual giants and the rest are, you know, JV. We can say that we have faith that is of equal standing as the apostles because... Faith doesn't depend on the one who has faith, but on the object of that faith. Peter tells us why our faith is of equal standing as the apostles. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So every Christian's faith, whether weak or strong, is of equal standing. Why? Because every Christian's faith is by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if the saving faith of the Apostle Paul and Peter led them to risk it all, my faith, if indeed it is true saving faith, will likewise lead me to risk much. I think where we stumble a lot is simply not understanding faith and the cost it comes with. And so thanks to Greg and his faith-stirring sermon last week, I want to spend today kind of backpacking off that subject matter. It's important that we recognize the subtle yet enormous difference. Faith is not believing in God, it is believing God. 
Subtle yet enormous difference. Faith is not believing in God, it's believing God. I'm sure we're all familiar with the, even the demons believe in shudder passage in James. But, but we have to be mindful of the context by which James says that. James 2, 18 through 20. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Saving faith produces something particular, namely fruit. Good works. So it's not enough to simply say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, meaning I merely acknowledge the existence of God. You might as well be an agnostic. Even the demons believe that God exists, and they tremble in fear of Him. So simply identifying as as a Christian and saying, I believe in Jesus, doesn't cut it. The demons believe in Jesus. So it means we have to examine our profession a little deeper than just the surface. In the Greek, saving faith speaks of this conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative and law of soul. Faith is being impelled and driven and moved by something that's higher than you. Namely, the Word of God the glory of God, the purpose of God. Faith is believing God or trusting God. It's trusting that God has said He would do this and I will stand on that no matter what happens. No matter what life looks like, faith moves me to trust God despite what I see. Last week, Greg said our faith is not a blind faith. Amen. It's, it's not. It's, it's not blindly jumping into some abyss hoping that it, well, it works out. And it's not an ignorant one either. So even more than believing God, faith is knowing in action. Faith is knowing put into action. So because I know what God has promised, because I know Jesus Christ, my life is affected by that knowing. It creates action in me. So I'm not living my life by what I see. I'm living my life as a Christian by what I know. By what I know to be true regardless of what it appears. It's the knowledge of Christ, this personal and intimate experiential knowledge, namely revealed through Scripture, that when grabbed hold of by faith, arouses the will to desire that which my faith is pointing to. Which means that faith is not just believing God or trusting Him. It is that. It's not just that. Faith is not only knowing in action. Faith is seeking God. This really is one of the most clear signs of saving faith. Where does it point you? Because faith will never point inward to itself. Faith will never point you to faith itself. It will never point you to anything in this world. It will never point you to an angel or anything else created. It will only and always point you to Jesus Christ. Faith seeks Christ. That's all it does. Now how that plays out, we can talk about for hours, but at, at, a, at a simple, practical level, faith seeks after Christ. Which means that I can know that I have saving faith by looking at that which my faith leads me to seek after. Our text today is in Colossians 3. First four verses. Colossians 3, the first four verses. We'll just read the text and then pick it apart. Colossians 3. Starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Now chapter 3 begins with, if then you have been raised with Christ. Now, because we know, again, we come back to the knowing that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Do you know that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Hallelujah. Because I know that, identifying with him in his death and resurrection becomes a reality for the Christian. And it is in identifying with Christ in his death and resurrection that fuels our seeking the things that are above. This word raise that Paul uses, synagairo, and it literally means to raise together. <laughs> we get our English word synergy from this word, which means the interaction of elements that when combined, they produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual parts. That's literally the union we have in Christ Jesus. We are united with him and made one in his death and resurrection. Paul explains this just one chapter before. Look at Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. He explains it more in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Was Paul hanging on the tree with Jesus? Not literally. Through faith he was. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if you are in Christ Jesus, then you have died and been raised from the dead. Spiritually. Look what Jesus said in John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So this one who has eternal life, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So those who have eternal life, which if you're in Christ, you have right now, have passed, past tense, have passed from death to life. This Greek verb, past, it's in the perfect tense. Meaning, because of what Christ has done on the cross, you have already once for all passed from death to life. Once for all. Meaning you've been resurrected in Christ already. Already you've been resurrected in Christ. Right now you're simply awaiting glorification. That's what we're waiting for. We've already been raised to new life in Christ. I'm alive in Christ now. I'm just waiting for the outward part of that. The glorified body, the glorification with Christ. But I've been raised to life in Christ and I'm seated, Paul says, currently in heavenly places with Christ. Christian, this is your current reality. Right now, as you sit here, you also sit in heavenly places with Christ. Make sense of that. Do you know this? Do you know this? Because if you do, it produces something in you. If you know this and you believe this, why? Because God said it. That's why we believe it. It drastically changes your life. What we believe matters. Because we live out of our beliefs. Whatever your beliefs are, you will live out of that. Now, indicatives in the Bible. We were talking about this the other day. You have indicatives in the Bible. They, they state what God has done or will do. Imperatives are commands. That's what we are to do. The imperative is contingent upon the indicative. We'll use an example in our text. What's the indicative in our text? Christ has raised us to life in Him. That's something that God has done, the indicative. What's the imperative, or we, our part? Seek the things above. So because of Christ and His finished work on my behalf and Him raising me to life in Him, because of that, I seek the things above where Christ is. 
As Herman Rinderboss pointed out, the imperative rests on the indicative, and this order is not reversible. Meaning, I do this because Jesus has already done that. So that which I'm called to in a Christian life, that, that encompasses your entire Christian life, rests on the work that Christ has done. It's built upon what he's done, not the other way around. Because the other way around, if I make the indicative contingent upon the imperative, it says, Christ has raised me to life because I was seeking him. That's anti-gospel, folks. Jesus raised me to new life because I was already seeking him out. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the gospel. The order is, I seek Jesus only because Jesus first sought after me. I love Jesus, why? Because he first loved me. The order's important. We could also understand it this way. Would we say someone who's been raised with Christ possesses saving faith? Yeah, we would, right? They've been raised to new life in Christ. They have faith in Christ. So I think it's fair to the text to say that raised with Christ and faith in Christ are synonymous. So, for example, we could read it, if then you have faith in Christ, seek the things above where Christ is. Why can we do that and still remain true to the intention of the text? Because saving faith is a seeking faith. If you've been made alive in Christ, you will seek the things that are above. And as we work through these four passages here, these four verses, that's what I want us to see. That, that, that it's about seeking Him. That that's the demonstration of my faith. In the practical sense, and that it is. This is one of the most fundamental characteristics of genuine saving faith. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6.33? Seek first your riches. Seek first your, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added. I know we've read this passage that I'm about to read frequently over the last year, but it's, it's an amazing text. Psalm 63, if you want to turn there, just listen. And I think this really captures the heartbeat of saving faith being a seeking faith. That faith in me produces a seeking after God. Beautiful sound, those pages turning. Come on, let's go. Psalm 63. We're just going to read the first eight verses. You can spend time on this passage in your own time. It says, Psalm 63, starting in verse 1, O oh God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek You. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You think... David is seeking after God earnestly. And I, I believe this is my conviction that this is one of the main characteristics of David that made him a man after God's own heart. That, that above all else, more than anything in life, he just wanted to be with Jesus. He, he just wanted to be in the presence of God. Yet he understood his depravity. <laughs> he knew he wasn't perfect. But he knew even in that he only had hope in one place. And that's at the feet of God and His mercy. David yearned for God, whether good moments, bad, whether in sin or obedience, David's heart was desperate for the Lord. And that's what faith does to us. Faith causes me to see, which prior to I'm blind of, my desperate need for saving. 
before faith shows up, before God does a work in me, I think I can save myself, or even worse, that I don't need saving at all because I'm not that bad. The guy over there needs saving. The guy on the news needs saving. But this guy, I'm not that bad. I can answer, is my heart desperate for the Lord by looking at what it is I seek after, by what it is that my soul thirsts for. Spurgeon said, our misery is that we thirst so little for these sublime things and so much for the mocking trifles of time and sense, meaning we thirst so little for the things of God and yet so much for the things of the world. And then wonder why we're not satisfied in God. We're trying to be satisfied by the world. And David is such an example for us. He says, God, your love is better than life. It's faith that leads you to that conclusion. You don't come to Jesus, your love is better than life without faith. It's faith that carries you to that point where you can say that and mean it. A heart filled with faith is a heart that seeks after the Lord. Now this word seek in our text, it means to strive after, to require and demand, to crave something. So if saving faith is a seeking faith, if we established, and seek means to crave that which you're seeking, we could say that saving faith has an appetite for that which it seeks after. Faith has an appetite for that which it seeks after. What does faith seek after? Christ. Faith has an appetite, meaning a hunger for Christ. Listen to David's words again. Oh God, you are my God. So David initially makes this profession of trust and faith in God. He didn't just say, oh God. No, oh God, you are my God. You're not just God. No, you're my God, my personal God. My relational God, my covenant God. Earnestly I seek you. This really is practical for me in life. Saving faith has an appetite for Christ which cultivates a desire in my heart to pursue Christ. And so as my faith matures, my desire for Him becomes more fervent, resulting in a more desperate, earnest pursuit after Christ. You know, I think a tragic misunderstanding in the church in our day and age is the idea that we we accept Christ. Just accept Christ into your heart. Just say a little prayer and accept Jesus and invite Him in, accept Him, and you're saved. And you got your ticket to heaven. And I think that's, I think that's deceiving because it's easy believism that says there's nothing else tied to that. Just, just say a little prayer and that's fine. Re- regardless of their love for sin still. LJ said yesterday, he quoted somebody, he said, he was Paul Washer, if you have a new relationship with God, but not a new relationship with sin, then you don't have a new relationship with God. Amen. And so this is important. It's, it's, it's just, it, it promises, look, you're, you're missing something in life, and that something is Jesus, so just ask Jesus to come into your heart, and He will, and your life will be complete then. As if, as if He becomes some addition to your life. And now that Jesus has been added to your life, he's, he's the missing piece, you're, you're good to go. And the fruit of that misunderstanding is a whole lot of Christians who claim faith in Jesus and because they don't understand what saving faith actually looks like, because they don't read about it in the Bible and they just go off what their pastor says, they don't recognize that even though they profess faith, their lack of pursuit after Christ is very concerning. I've professed faith in Jesus, but I don't really care to seek after Jesus. That's a red flag. And so it's almost as if Jesus becomes hell insurance. Right? I mean, I have insurance on my car, on my house, on my body, on my life. And, and, and what? I, I, I mean, we know how this works. I don't pursue my insurance company unless there's been an accident. I just make my payment each month, send them money, Otherwise, this insurance gives me peace of mind as I carry on with my own life. The deception is that I just say a little prayer, ask Jesus to come into my heart, and now I'm safe from hell. I show up once a week, pay my dues, cut my check, but otherwise, unless there's been an accident, I'm really not out seeking Jesus. 
And that becomes, believe it or not, the peace of mind for many who profess Christ. That's their peace, is that I said a prayer and I tithe. That's what the Pharisees said. And if, if that's my comfort, if woe is me if that's my comfort. I, I mean, really, I say that genuinely. And as I was working through this, I had to say, okay, wait a second. Where's Jovi's heart? If my peace of mind is on something I'm doing, <laughs> I'm missing it. Alistair Begg's devotional this morning posed a serious question. Shook me this morning says, what about you? When you honestly consider your heart's inclination, do you say to God, you are useful rather than you are worthy? Is the inclination of your heart to say, God, you're useful to me rather than you are worthy? Because there's a huge difference, saints. One goes to God for what God can give. The other goes to God for God Himself. Whether He gives or takes. I want God. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. Jesus asked the question in Luke 18, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You know the context in which he asked that question? The persistence of God's elect day and night crying out to him. To Jesus, that was the demonstration of faith whereby he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He's talking about faith being demonstrated in a desperate seeking after Christ. So the proper question is not when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith out there in the earth? But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith right here? Amen. That's right. right here. Saving faith is a seeking faith. Now in our next verse, which we're going to look at more in a moment, Paul doesn't just say, Seek the things above, but he also tells us where not to seek. He says in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. And Paul exhorts us with this because we constantly struggle with this. Living in the world and not becoming of the world. A.W. Tozer says it perfectly. He says, the things that are of earth belong to sight, reason, and our senses. The things that are in heaven belong to faith, trust, and confidence in God. Over on the left-hand side, we put pleasures of the earth. And on the right side, we put delight in the Lord. On the left, we put treasures of the earth. On the right, we put treasures where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. On the left, we put our reputation among men and our desire to stand well with men. On the right, we put our desire to stand high with God. Over on the left, we put a rich dwelling place. On the right, we put a mansion above. On the left, we put a desire to walk with the best company here below. On the right, we put a desire to walk with God here below. On the left, we put following man's philosophy. And on the right, following God's revelations. On the left, cultivating the flesh. On the right, living for the Spirit. On the left, to live for a time. On the right, to live for eternity. And we're right there in the middle, constantly being pulled both ways. The flesh constantly wars against the Spirit so that we won't do the things that we want to do, Paul says. We desire the things of God, but those things are unseen and i got to wait for them. The things of the world, well, I can see them and touch them and taste them and, 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 and I can handle them and I can have those right now. And thus the war wages. And so we need to be regularly reminded of this. Seek the things above, not the things below. Sinclair Ferguson said, In all things, seek God's glory and guard your heart. Christians are always in need of this wise counsel. So when I resolve or I make it my aim, even when I wake up in the morning, today, God, I'm going to strive to glorify you in all things. All things. This is what Paul had in mind in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So faith takes the most simple and most natural activities we do, eating and drinking. And it turns those acts into acts of praise, acts of worship. So I'm not just eating dinner. I'm eating dinner unto the glory of God. Faith provides for us heavenly motives for earthly duties. 
So now I do my earthly duties with a heavenly mindset and a heavenly motive. And that changes. Now it's not, man, I got to take out the garbage. It's Lord, thank you that you've given me all this stuff that's a crude garbage that I got to take it out. You're faithful. Right. Saving faith is a seeking faith, church. A.W. Tozer said, It is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular, it is why he does it. Now, whereas seeking the things above is an outward activity, setting your mind on things above is an inward activity. An important misunderstanding before we move on. Salvation was free, therefore there is no cost for me in the faith, right? Wrong. Wrong. Your salvation did not cost you anything. It cost the Son of God everything. But that doesn't mean there's not a cost for us in following Jesus. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it the cost of discipleship. It will cost you your very life. You must deny yourself for you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Luke 9.62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And saving faith, because it always seeks after Christ, gladly and willfully pays that price. (laughs) Faith recognizes that Jesus is worth far more than we can give, and that all I can give to Him is my life. So here it is, Lord. Saving faith keeps us fixed straight ahead and not looking back. Moses is an example. Hebrews 11, 24-26 By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Faith compels us to abandon the world because even the reproach of Christ, meaning the suffering that comes with following Christ, is of greater worth than all the treasures of the world. Amen. Verse 2 of our text in Colossians 3. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Other translations say set your affections on things that are above. It's the Greek word phroneo, to have understanding, to feel, to think. It speaks of one's interests and views. So to set your mind on things above, it really just means to be heavenly minded. Meaning the trajectory of my life is heavenward because my aim is heavenward. I don't remember what it says, but you hit what you aim at. Aim long enough at your flesh, you'll hit it. It means you live your life now with heaven in view. And seeking and setting your mind work together. They, they operate within each other. So that which I seek after, I will spend my time thinking about, and vice versa. <coughs> now the Scriptures are clear as to what we are to fix our minds on. Philippians 4.8. We're all familiar with this passage. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So saving faith affects my mind as well. My daily thought life. Faith sees the thoughts of God in Scripture. And it moves us to put on the mind of Christ. That I want to think this way. That's what I want to think on. That's what I want to dwell on. And Paul understands the connection between the heart and the mind. So what we really need to examine, saints, is our voluntary thoughts. When you're free to think, what is it that you think about? When you're not at work, having to keep your mind on track for the task at hand or whatever, when you're free to just think about whatever it is you want to think about, what do you think about? Because it's those thoughts that reveal what it is that we're seeking after and setting our hearts upon. Romans 8, 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So that which your mind is pleased to dwell on reveals that which your heart is inclined toward. 
I think this is really one of the biggest problems for many in the church is they, they just let their mind think about whatever. There's no casting down and arresting of thoughts like Paul tells us to. They just let them roam around in there freely. We grab hold of our thoughts. But it affects our heart. Paul says something interesting in 2 Corinthians 7 too. He tells the Corinthian believers to make room in your hearts for us. So the Corinthians were believing and spreading lies about Paul as he was loving them and serving them. They were actually opposing him and his companions. And Paul tells them, make room in your hearts for us. So that means that that to a certain degree, what fills up my heart depends on what I'm making room for. The things we set our mind on, our affections towards, are the things that we make room for in our hearts. Think about it. You make room in your house for what it is that you want in your house, right? Right? If you don't want it anymore, what do you do? Do you keep it? No, you get rid of it. You don't want it there anymore. So that which you want there, Sal, I know what you're laughing at. That which you want to make room for, even if you have storage is full of stuff, (laughs) that which you want to make room for, you move around. You, You take something else out so that that will find a place. So begs the question, what are you making room for in your heart? Again, in order to make room for one thing, I have to refuse to make room for something else. So in the context of our verse, if you are making room in your heart for earthly things, you are not making room for heavenly things. And this reveals to me whether I'm walking in faith or not. Remember, faith seeks Christ. If the thing that my mind and my heart is seeking is not Christ, it's flesh. And I really think it is that black and white. I mean, we we make room in our heart for the Lord by setting our mind on Him, on the things above. And the reality is, the more of our heart we give to the world, the less our heart desires Christ. And vice versa. Vice versa. The more of your heart you give to the Lord the world just seems to leave a bad taste in your mouth anymore. You just don't want it anymore. And all of that is done by faith. It's by faith that I believe that since God has commanded me to love Him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, that He's also made a provision for me to obey that command. That means God has given me everything I need to love Him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Therefore, where should I run? Towards Him. And cry out for this. God, help me to make room for You in my heart. So often, Lord, I crowd You out with the things of the world and I don't want that. Give my heart godly affections and burn out the worldly ones that are in there. Give me the grace, Lord, to pursue the things above and what? Abandon the things below. And we ask Him these things believing by faith that He will do these things. Why? Because it's His will. Faith always seeks to saturate the heart and the mind in Christ. Verse 3 of Colossians 3 again, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You were dead in your trespasses, as LJ read earlier from Ephesians 2, a rotting corpse of wickedness and evil. You were morally and spiritually without life and therefore void of relationship with God. The only relationship that you had with God was a deserving recipient of His wrath and judgment. That was the result of original sin. We're all there until we've been born again. You're born in sin and only God's sovereign grace can change that. But God, the gospel in two words, made you alive in Christ. But then you were baptized in death with Christ. And then you were raised to Christ. You were raised from that filthy tomb of sin. And now, where is your life now? Hidden in Christ. Life is found in only one place. In Jesus Christ. 
And in your pursuit of Christ, be encouraged and strengthened by this truth, saints. Your life is hidden in Christ Jesus permanently. You have been sealed by the Spirit of God, Paul says, till the day of redemption. Verse 4 of our text. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Guys, this is our hope. That Christ will return and those who have their life hidden in Him will appear with Him. You know why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love? Well, for now, the time being, faith, hope, and love abide. Love is the greatest. Why? Faith and hope will disappear. They are temporary. They are for this age. Our faith will disappear when it becomes fully realized as we wrap our arms around our loving Savior. You will have no need for faith anymore, saints. You will see Him as He is. Amen. Hope will be fulfilled. Paul says, who hopes for what he already has? Nope. We're not hoping for what we have now. We're hoping for what we're going to receive. So hope is for now until the day of Christ Jesus, but it will be the perfect love of God that lasts for eternity as God and His blood-washed people dwell together. And faith looks to Christ with eager, joyful expectation of His return. So the child of faith should. It was the saving faith of the Apostle Paul that was woven into these words as he penned them in Philippians 1.21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The very substance of our life is Christ. And to die is gain. Why? Because it ushers us into the very arms of Christ. What a glorious future awaits you, Christian. Now we briefly stated this point earlier, but I think it's important to emphasize again before we come to a close. Now these are not prerequisites for faith, because again, faith is sovereignly given to us by God apart from us. But you could say these are post-requisites, meaning if saving faith is present... These two things will be present. Not fully and perfectly, but surely they will be present. If saving faith is present, two things must be stated. We must completely forsake the world. We must fully turn to the Lord. Amen. That's what repentance is. And we see that all throughout the Bible. Demonstrations of faith. It was a forsaking this and a turning to and a running to that. A turning from the world, a turning to Christ. That's the nature of faith. So these two things are most necessary, complete abandonment and complete surrender. A child of faith may struggle with the world, but deep down inside, they despise the world and want nothing to do with the world. Yeah, they flirt with it, but the regenerated them grieves over it. That's the reality of faith. Before we close, I just want to share a couple practical ways to cultivate this. Number one, remember that your faith grows in direct proportion to your knowledge of Christ. Greg shared from Romans 10 last week, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Amen. This means the same word that brought about your faith is the same word that sustains and grows your faith. Hallelujah. So again, you cannot have faith in what you don't know. Greg emphasized that. Your faith needs the word of God. So we saturate our life in the Word of God. You can't get enough of it. Number two, surrendering all of our acts and thoughts to Him. We don't have a sacred life and a secular life. Our whole life is sacred because our whole life has been purchased. And it's God's. And God's concerned with everything we do, not just church stuff. He's concerned with everything. So in a practical sense, I can begin taking inventory of my life. Is there anything in my life that maybe crowds Jesus out of my heart? Is there anything in my life that may be captivating more of my thought life than Jesus? We also got to be intentional about the thoughts we allow to remain. Don't let it stay there. Paul says cast it down. We got to tighten up security in our minds, saints. And number three, prayer. Look to fill your life with prayer while you drive, while you do the dishes, whatever it is you're doing. And as you think of Christ, pray short prayers. Not every prayer has to be this super long, eloquent prayer. A.W. Tozer calls them thought prayers. It's just a, a short thought that's, that's exalting Christ. 
Because your thoughts are audible to God. He hears our thoughts. Praise Him for His love. Praise Him for His goodness. Praise Him for His presence. Praise Him for everything. But it's praying without ceasing seen and simply fellowshipping with Him without ceasing. It's not just talking to Him. It's singing praises to Him. Meditating on His promises. Sitting in silence and solitude. Just making Christ your aim again. Just putting the world out and saying, I have got distracted. And Lord, I fix my heart and my mind on You in this moment. It's an unceasing relationship. And this is something we strive to grow in. Again, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for what it is that's being sought after. We're looking to invest in our relationship with Christ. Why? Because He's worth it. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 13, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. God calls us to give our lives to one single purpose. Christ. And as A. Craig Troxell says, when we maintain that singular purpose in our lives, we can say to God, I am sincerely yours. This is not the boast of perfect disciples. It is the mark of genuine disciples. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I want to be able to honestly say the same thing Asaph did in Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you, Lord. To be able to honestly say that and stand by that is, wow. I don't even want heaven if Jesus isn't there. (laughs) Saving faith is a seeking faith. John Piper gives a definition of sin. He says, what is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is sin. As I was pondering this, because I read this years ago and it's always stuck with me, but as I was pondering this and working through this and faith and what opposes sin? I mean, faith does, right? Paul says in Romans 14, anything not done in faith is sin. So anything I'm not doing in faith, according to the Apostle Paul, is is sin. So sin always points me away from Jesus. Always. Sin will never genuinely point you to Jesus. It points me to myself, to the world, to the enemy. But faith, as we have said, always points to Jesus Christ. So, let's reverse Piper's definition of sin and replace it with faith. What is faith? The glory of God honored. The holiness of God reverenced. The greatness of God admired. The power of God praised. The truth of God sought. The wisdom of God esteemed. The beauty of God treasured. The goodness of God savored. The faithfulness of God trusted. The commandments of God obeyed. The justice of God respected. The wrath of God feared. The grace of God cherished. The presence of God prized. The person of God loved. That is faith. Biff, will you hand out the elements? I don't think John Piper would mind me doing that to his definition. You know, Greg brought up a passage last week that's tucked away in the deep, dark pages of the minor prophets where few venture. You know those pages that are usually stuck together and you skip it? Where's Obadiah at? He read from Habakkuk 2, 3 through 4. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The writer of Hebrews references that passage, but he also adds something incredible. Hebrews 10, 37-39. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Catch this, saints. But we, those that are in Christ, 
are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That's found in Christ, saints. Saints. 